I'm really happy about Jade Empire, and I'm going to talk about it eventually. That should be enough hook for you, right? I'm an Asian American who grew up in the late 90s and early 2000s, a time that for me was devoid of seeing my culture represented. What I mean to say is I'm a second generation Filipino American who grew up not really knowing what that means. I think that as children, the notions of race and heritage don't have much meaning, especially when attending diverse spaces in the United States. That isn't to say children aren't exposed to racism, but it's often seen in hindsight, or at least it was to me. Okay, let me pause right here. This isn't a video about race, but I am sharing my experience with racial insensitivities in order to frame my personal connection to some types of media. Back to it. I'm Filipino, but that didn't really mean anything to other people and therefore didn't hold much meaning for me. The fact that I'm Asian, now that's what people really cared about. I would be told things like, oh, you're good at math, you're good at drawing, you're good at video games. Do you know karate? Where are you from? No, where are you really from? I wasn't being validated as a Filipino or as an American. Rather, I was being validated for fitting stereotypes that describe this encompassing, ambiguous Asian identity. <laughs> Looking back, I see now that what I was experiencing was the slow erasure of my heritage to be lumped into a larger, more racialized category. And well, I'm not trying to denounce the Asian American identity, because that sense of unity with other Asians in America feels positive, but I was losing touch with my own culture in the process, and I didn't always feel like being Filipino was Asian enough for the club. It feel simultaneously unifying and alienating. And it certainly didn't help that the contemporary media often made jokes about this disillusion of Asian American identities. So are you Chinese or Japanese? I live in California last 20 years, but uh, first come from Laos. Huh? Laos. We Laotian. The ocean? What ocean? We are Laotian from Laos, stupid. It's a landlocked country in Southeast Asia. It's between Vietnam and Thailand, okay? Population 4.7 million. So are you Chinese or Japanese? Which I understand to be a satirical jab at Hank Hill and his friends. That is the subtext. And hell, I understand that the point of the episode as a whole is that regardless of ethnicity, everyone just kind of sucks, which is our common ground as neighbors. But satire is a double-edged sword, and people in my life were engaging more with the text rather than the subtext. In other words, people would laugh over the message and copy the thing that made them laugh to the detriment of others. So are you Chinese so or Japanese? Are you Chinese, Chinese or Japanese? Or Japanese? Chinese or Japanese? So growing up, all I really knew was that I was some Chinese kind of Asian in America where during this time period, anything of vaguely Asian origin exposed to me brought some sense of identity, some external validation of my character or myself. The kind that portrayed Asian people and Asian culture as positive and equally valuable to others in the United States. The kind that reaffirmed my sense of belonging to, well, anything. So anime, manga, some video games. There was a sense of pride in knowing that Asian hands were involved in their creation and that my Asian hands were involved in their consumption. I felt like a part of me as the ambiguous Asian American had some ownership over whatever form of Asian culture that spread to American media. And this is why growing up during Jackie Chan's Hollywood A-list period, kung fu flicks kind of have a special place in my heart. After all, I didn't see a whole lot of people who looked like me in American-made media, so seeing his movies was how I got to see real-life Asians being cool and heroic, which certainly made me feel like I could be cool and heroic growing up. 
so now you know basically uh i love martial arts movies wow i i could have started with that so back in 2005 bioware released a little game called jade empire as a sort of dream project of theirs they've been wanting and waiting to put together since before kotor bioware wanted to let players experience the journey of a wuxia hero firsthand tapping into a beautiful yet underutilized setting for role-playing games in a genre super saturated with westernized fantasy and science fiction worlds jade empire is a refreshing take with a wonderfully inspired setting. It's a setting that I think lends itself to the role-playing game extremely well. Many kung fu films mirror the conventions of strong RPGs. Take the 36th Chamber of Shaolin, for example, where Gordon Luz Sante is forced to leave his home by villainous Manchu oppressors, broken and left with nothing. He trains in the Shaolin martial arts and returns to free his town and begin a political revolution. He gathers allies, hatches a plan, begins a counterattack. And side note, if you haven't seen this movie, it is one of the best kung fu movies of all time. Half of it is just the training sequence, and that's a huge part of its charm. Like seriously, go watch it. Kung fu movie beats are identical to the experience of RPGs from Final Fantasy 2 to Kingdom Come Deliverance, so for Bioware that translation of media from film to game was extremely smooth in Jade Empire. This is a game that fits both the wuxia and video game molds very comfortably. You begin the game as a young martial arts student on the precipice of completing your training, your village is attacked, your master is kidnapped, and you travel the land and hone your skills before finally facing again against the Emperor and his masked lieutenant and uh, it's it's Star Wars. It's it's Star Wars. Well, not completely, but I think that explains enough of the story without giving too much away. The story is so well written that I'd hate to spoil it for the people who might be interested in playing after this video. I will be doing a spoilerific narrative breakdown at the end just for fun, because you can't praise this game enough without talking about its story. But for now, this is all you really need to know. There are many influences from different wuxia and kung fu stories and films that you see reflected in the characters and the world. Take the character Silk Fox, a princess who practices swordplay in secret and often disguises herself as a thief or assassin, who shares many similarities with the governor's daughter in Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon, secretly taught the Wu-Tang sword style by a thief and assassin named Jade Fox. Of course, that isn't nearly as blatant an homage as the Black Whirlwind, the most murder hobo -y murder hobo character that Bioware has ever made, and a direct reference to the Water Margins Li Kuei, sharing between them a penchant for drinking, battle fury, women, poor hygiene, double axes, and general murder hobo -iness. <laughs> So long as I'm fighting and drinking, preferably at the same time, <laughs> I think I can let that part where you pay me slide. Li Kuei is also called the Black Whirlwind in the Water Margin novel, as well as the Iron Ox. Coincidentally, or not, Jade Empire's Whirlwind has a brother named Raging Ox. Some of the lesser influences or references to kung fu movies in the game include the drunken master style of fighting made famous by Jackie Chan and the monster infested Pilgrim's Rest Inn that very closely mimics this scene in Gordon Liu's Shaolin vs Evil Dead. Part of the larger influences in the game's world building is Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon's story setting as a China of the imagination, a world drawing from the culture and history of China without being restricted by reality. Thus, in Jade Empire, the mythological demons and gods of Journey to the West, and the different kinds of ghosts and spirits from Strange Tales from a Chinese Studio are a tangible part of the game world and not just background lore. Players would literally walk alongside demons and spirits, fighting some and aiding others. One prominent example of this is the demon pair of Chai Ka and Ya Shen. Chai Ka is a heavenly gate guardian, a relatively benevolent demon with a just purpose sent from the heavens to aid you on your quest. Of course, because the world is governed by a strict adherence to this concept of balance and dualism, the presence of a just demon must be balanced with that of an evil one. Thus, Chai Ka is forced to share a body with Ya Shen, a demon toad that spreads discord and acts only for its own benefit. As the two demons battle over control, of their anchor, a young girl named Wildflower, the player has to make the moral decision to aid one and suppress the other. While Chai Ka is sworn to follow you and serve you on your journey as well as protect Wildflower, Ya Zhen is more likely to allow you to take a more self-serving or destructive action, but doesn't really care for Wildflower. What's the point of having a will if you do 
do not enforce it. These kinds of moral choices are presented to the player throughout the game, asking you to choose between two different philosophies. Open Palm, which promotes harmony and selflessness. A term for the high path, or perhaps the way of restraint and harmony. Many aspire to it, but few achieve it. It is a path of resisting tyranny and Closed Fist, which demonstrates a strength and survival of the fittest mentality. It is the low path, the way of aggression and discord, a misunderstood path often misused by those who wish to justify a thuggish nature. Given the explanations of the two paths in the beginning of the game, Bioware clearly intended to introduce a more nuanced and complex approach to morality in this game that goes beyond good and evil. That maybe touches more on selflessness versus selfishness. On the surface, Bioware does a decent job of integrating these philosophies into the game's role-playing. One of the early decisions you make in the game is whether to provide medical aid to a recently injured student, Kia Min. By providing her with a poultice for her injury, you would be able to spar with her and receive a reward. And the game makes it very clear from the beginning, in order to follow the high or low path, you need to be connected to the world. So. In this case, you need to do something about this injury, or you're not going to uh, move up or down in terms of your morality points. The open palm path would have you buy more expensive ingredients for the poultice, allowing her to fight and train at her best without risking further injury to her body. For the closed fist path, you would buy a cheaper poultice that would numb her pain without helping her risking further injury down the line and making it much easier for you to spar with her. And that seems more like a dick move than one that promotes strength and survival, but it is consistent with closed fist ideologies. You are punishing her for being stupid enough to train while injured, teaching her not to rely on others to get her own medicine, and making it easier for yourself to earn this prize while preserving your wealth and status in the process. But what interests me the most about the way of the closed fist idea is that it's not totally unaltruistic. There's some worldly benefit for a closed fist player to act in a closed fist way. The game suggests that this path isn't necessarily evil, that a closed fist warrior would choose to act in order to promote a stronger world, fix an unfair situation, or even eventually punish those who have done wrong. An evil man might ignore a plea for help because he does not care, but that shows a disconnection with the world. That is not part of the way. A man on the low path might also ignore that plea, but he would do so because that person should demonstrate they are fit to survive on their own. The difference is in the details. That same man might help if the odds are unreasonable. He might also do it to incur favor. There is thought in his actions. He is not a mindless killer, but he may let strength decide what course is best. For example, when you rescue the young woman Fuyao from slavers, you can either drive off the slave master yourself, or give the girl a dagger and teach her to use her own strength. The closed fist path isn't necessarily the evil choice here, and benefits Fuyao by teaching her to defend herself. When thought of that way, morality becomes much more meaningful than acting selflessly versus selfishly. And you start to see where Bioware ultimately failed to live up to its promise of moral nuance and complexity as not all closed fist choices are done as well as the previous example, and sometimes choices can be downright inconsistent with the philosophy in parts of the game. One open palm decision has you actively participate in a character's murderous revenge plot. Aishi the Mournful Blade tells you the story of how the guardsman Captain Sen convinced her to let a young boy they bullied die. The boy I loved turned to me and said, If we help him, he'll only tell the others what we have done. We have to let him go. When you bring her to Sen, she prepares to kill him as a means of balancing the scales for their past crime. Open Palm players can only allow this revenge killing to happen, even when Sen asks for help. The player cheekily turns his words against him. If I help you, you'll only tell others what I've done. I have to let you go. While extremely satisfying, it certainly doesn't feel like the words or actions of someone who promotes harmony. Personally, I feel that an open palm player would try to convince Aishi to let it go and leave, when a neutral or closed fist player would allow the murder to happen. Or maybe a really closed fist player would just kill them both and punish them for their shared crime. And this kind of moral complexity in sacrifice versus vengeance or punishment, and which one is better for the world in the end, can be seen in the wuxia film 
Hero, one of the major influences in making this game. Hero is a loose adaptation of the failed assassination of the King of Qin, China's first emperor. The creation of the Qin Dynasty and Imperial China itself was the foundation for the world of Jade Empire. The first Jade Emperor, Sagacious Tian, fought to unite the different nations of the land just as the Qin waged war to unify the seven warring states. Sagacious Tian is said to have established the empire based on what the heavens had told him, tracing the northern border by the path of the shooting star. Similarly, the King of Chin in Hero wages his war under the philosophy of Tian Sha. He wished to unify all under heaven. Less important, this emperor's tomb is famously protected by a terracotta army, the obvious inspiration for the clay golems the Jade Empire uses in battle. The nameless assassin in Hero is presented with a moral conundrum. His purpose is to kill the King of Qin and end the war of conquest with the other states. He wishes to take revenge for his lost family and his lost country. But as he speaks to the King of Qin and recalls his conversations with the retired assassin Broken Sword, his resolve is called into question. <laughs> To kill the King of Qin brings nameless vengeance for his lost home and punishes the king for starting this long bloody war in the first place. But it also means a return to the seven warring states, leading to countless more deaths in the future. To allow him to live and go through with his unification plan means the end of the seven warring states period, that eventually the killing will stop and there will be peace among the land. But it also means conceding that his ends justify his means, that he will eventually be erasing cultures and identities, and that nameless would have to die for his assassination attempt. Ha! Huh. Remember the beginning of this video when I was talking about my own conflicting feelings on the erasure of my heritage but finding unity within a larger identity? What I'm saying is that this movie is amazing and you definitely need to watch it. Nameless's moral challenge parallels a similar problem presented towards the end of Jade Empire. I promise I'm not spoiling anything major. Within the game, the Empire had just begun to recover from a period they call the Long Drought, a decade of scorching heat with little to no rainfall leading to hundreds of thousands of deaths in the land. The Emperor Sun Hai, in order to save his people, seeks to capture a goddess known as the Water Dragon. This leads to a war with her protectors, the Spirit Monks, in a genocidal campaign to end the Long Drought. The Emperor succeeds in killing all the Spirit Monks and enslaving the Water Dragon, producing free-flowing water for the Jade Empire over the next 20 years. When the Empire attacks your village, it's revealed that you are the last spirit monk, and you must embark on a journey to rescue your kidnapped master and make the emperor pay for destroying your home, attacking the gods, and murdering your people. When you reach the emperor, this is where the right thing becomes kind of hard to see. Killing the emperor and freeing the water dragon means avenging both your home village and the order of spirit monks, but it also means the return of the long drought, the deaths of countless people, and the eventual end of the Jade Empire. It means the loss of thousands of years of prosperity, culture, and civilization. Sparing the Emperor means the Empire and its people will live on, but of course both you and your master would have to die, and the Water Dragon must remain enslaved. You have to ask yourself, is taking his life worth the many deaths to starvation and thirst that would follow, or is the peace and prosperity of the Empire and its people worth the genocide of your people, the burning of your village, and the enslavement of a god? There isn't a clear moral victory, and that makes it really interesting. Or or at least that could have been the case. Bioware thought to add more elements into the story that demystify right and wrong, making clear which choice is heroic, which is selfish, and which is stupid. The water dragon is the shepherd of the dead, leading spirits to the afterlife and allowing them to reincarnate. Subjugating her severed the connection to the underworld, throwing the living one off balance and leaving the dead to wander the earth, often confused and angry. Confused and angry ghosts kill people, making more confused and angry ghosts. Allowing the Emperor to live doesn't actually save lives, and in fact makes the world much worse over time. The drought itself is said by the Water Dragon to ensure Sun Hai's empire would fade, so something new would bloom. Emperor Sun would not accept that his empire had to fade so that something new would bloom. He declared war as if the drought was an advancing army. 
That seems a bit ambiguous, maybe a little foreboding, maybe warning that the drought would return if she's freed. But when you do free the water dragon, the epilogue makes no mention of the long drought returning. So we can instead interpret her meaning to be that the drought ends Sun Hai's rule specifically, so that a new ruler could take his place further simplifying the choice to free her and dethrone the emperor as strictly good. In fact, the only reason not to free the water dragon is to absorb her godly powers for yourself to rule over the Jade Empire as its new god. A choice strictly selfish and decidedly evil within the game, even if you plan to be a kind or just leader. So the only choices the game presents to you are the obvious good path, to free the water dragon and kill the emperor, thus restoring balance to the world, the evil path to absorb the water dragon's power and rise as the new god emperor of the Jade Empire, and the stupid path to sacrifice yourself much like the nameless hero so that the emperor can impose his order to build a better world. He erects a memorial in your image, very tasteful, and brings about an orderly totalitarian state where people are watched over by gigantic creepy golems doesn't exactly do any good for the world. To me, the struggle to make the right decision is what makes moral choices in a game more interesting than choosing between good or evil. And although Jade Empire makes a claim to that moral ambiguity, it's much more simple than it seems and much more rewarding to those who choose good. Alright, missed opportunities aside, this game is still absolutely fantastic and there's a lot more to talk about. Because of the obvious influence of kung fu movies, they had to make sure combat emulated the kind of action you would see in a martial arts drama. Combat begins slow and clunky as I begin with very limited martial styles, but as I add more to my repertoire, I can string different styles together in extremely satisfying combinations. Enemies have different weaknesses and immunities to different styles, so rapidly changing your moves to fit the situation is enforced through gameplay, creating depth to the combat and mirroring the chess boxing philosophies of kung fu fights in classic movies. That transition from novice with clumsy hands to master with flowing fists certainly evokes the dance-like choreography of the best kung fu movies, and that feeling of being a wuxia superhero is reinforced through other mechanics in the game. You aren't flying across the battlefield like wire fu, but you are able to move at superhuman speed with a focused and trained mind, and enhance your physical strength by manipulating your chi. Another praiseworthy part of this game is how Bioware where it makes great effort to be respectful of its inspirations in the writing, never making jokes at the expense of Asian culture or people. In fact, many of the jokes thrown in the game were made with a Western audience in mind, such as the malapropping Kui the Promoter, voiced by the iconic Brian Doyle Murray, and this obvious Simpsons reference. Everything I say is perfectly cromulent, and it might do you well to embiggen your vocabulary before you fling accretions my discretion. There's also the entire character of Sir Roderick Ponce von Fontelbottom, the Magnificent Bastard. Wow, what a name. Uh, he is a humorous amalgam of European explorers, aptly voiced by the very talented John Cleese, meant to satirize European imperialist attitudes and give players the opportunity to confront those ideas head on. Something else kind of cool, not really joke related or writing related, but they got geek golden boy Nathan Fillion to voice your arrogant, whiny rival Gao the Lesser during the intro of the game. Oh, you're finally here to talk to Master Lee, are you? I certainly hope so. The old man is in there meditating and he won't train me until he talks to you. But what's even more impressive than the voice talents they managed to sneak into the game is the atmosphere of a classic Shaw Brothers movie they were able to create through the quality of the lip syncing. All the others seek to know my secrets, I will not share them. Speaking of voice acting, one thing I find kind of questionable, although I recognize how it's made to make the game world more immersive, is the constructed language of Tho Fan. Apparently Bioware hired a linguist to construct a language for the imperial elite of the Jade Empire. Apparently it has actual rules and conventions. And apparently, from what I hear in the game, Bioware kinda just recorded a few dozen lines and reused them over and over with no regard for their intended meanings. <laughs> As a result, it all kind of comes across like... Another problematic element of the game is its treatment of women in some instances, in one case literally referring to the female lead as a prize to be won. Context only makes this worse as she had just been kidnapped. 
Gal the Lesser shouldn't get such a prize without a fair fight. And, of course, being just a little nice to the two female leads in your dialogue automatically puts you in a romantic relationship with both of them. And when they make complaints about hostility in the team, your only options are to suggest that they're jealous over you, or straight tell them to shut up. I think I am perceived as a rival, but no one has told me what the game is. I just want to be friends, why are you making this uncomfortable? And that's not me being against romance in a role-playing game, I mean romance is good seasoning to any story, but this whole exchange is just clumsy and awkward. If you're gonna put in the effort to make an entire fake language, then you can also put in the effort to not write sexist stuff? Maybe? Like, is this to mimic the patriarchal values of China, or is it just a product of its time? I mean, like, yeah, it's 2005, I guess a lot of people thought that gamers were mostly dudes, but Bioware has always been pretty inclusive in their games. Jade Empire allows for same-sex romances, for example. I guess the sexism was meant to add to the historic Asian atmosphere. Like, I get it's just a few lines in a much larger game, and there are multiple examples of empowered women in Jade Empire, but that's even more reason to question why lines like that needed to be included at all. At least, having played both the Mass Effect and Dragon Age series, I can say Bioware has evolved past this kind of thing, so good on them for that. Okay, I think that covers pretty much everything I want to say about the game without spoiling anything too important to the experience. I am going to do a fully spoiled circle breakdown at the end just because, like I said, you can't talk about this game and not bring up the story. But I want to reiterate that this is a fantastic game with a few flaws. There's a couple moments of unfortunate sexism that feels out of place in a mostly inclusive game, and maybe they played it a little too safe with what was otherwise a promising morality system. I enjoyed it on multiple playthroughs, the narrative is incredible, I think it did a wonderful job at using its inspirations while being respectful of the cultures and stories from which it borrows. I think the combat is a lot of fun and has a surprising amount of depth, and I think Bioware succeeded in delivering a refreshing wuxia fantasy experience to role-playing games. What Bioware accomplished, in short, is one of the sweetest love letters to kung fu cinema I've ever experienced after Kung Pao. If you're a fan of martial arts movies or just kind of want a different setting in your RPG, definitely give this game a shot. <sighs> Alright, thanks for watching. If you made it this far, please leave a comment that says... What do you get when you cross an owl with a bungee cord? And I'll respond with a virtual high five. I'm about to go full spoilers, so definitely leave now if that's the kind of stuff you're trying to avoid. And don't forget to like and subscribe on your way out. Okay, just as a means of testing the theory, I want to see if Jade Empire lines up with this story circle. You begin as a martial arts student about to complete your training under Master Lee. As it turns out, you're the last spirit monk, and Master Lee was once Sun Lee the glorious strategist, brother to the emperor who apparently opposed the genocide of your people and rescued you at birth. He prepares you for your journey to restore balance to the world, reminding you to keep the basics of his lessons at heart until your village is attacked and your master is kidnapped. You need to complete the dragon amulet and rescue your master from the empire, so you go out on your journey. You search for the pieces of the amulet and any clues to Master Lee's location, facing many martial arts masters, demons, and ghosts along the way, growing your skills as a warrior. And then you complete the amulet and find your master, you defeat the emperor, and uh... Huh. I, I guess that's the end. Nope, okay. Let's rewind. From the beginning of the game, your master makes several questionable decisions for one who claims to be called the Glorious Strategist. He creates and provokes your rival in Gal the Lesser, showing you clear favoritism in both manner and training, and purposely reveals that he is a wanted traitor to the Empire to your petty classmate, which then prompts the invasion of your hometown by Lotus Assassins. He turns himself in despite knowing the Lotus Assassins leave no survivors. This makes you think of your master as a helpless victim who tried to do the right thing, and it's your duty as a student to rescue him. As you travel throughout the Empire, and face multiple warriors, some comment on your skill as both formidable and eerie, as if there's a kind of flaw they cannot see, drawing them in and making them vulnerable to you. When you defeat the Emperor and rescue Master Lee, he reveals to you that there is, in fact, a secret flaw that only he knows how to exploit. We have purposely trained him wrong, as a joke. <laughs> 
So you rescue your master only to realize that this was part of his 20 year plan to defeat his brother's son Hai, claim your completed amulet, and usurp the throne and the power of the water dragon in just... 4 moves. Glorious strategist indeed. So you got what you wanted, but now you pay the price for it with your life. You learn the complete truth behind Sun Li's plans, but also learn that the Water Dragon had plans of her own. Using her brief moment of freedom after you defeat the Emperor, and before Sun Li claims her power to bring your spirit to Dirge, where you can return to the world of the living. Now changed. You correct your fatal flaw, and your true enemy is revealed. You defeat Sun Li and beat the game. And that fits the monomyth very comfortably. And like god, this was seriously one of the best twists in a story. They. They never lie to you, and when you go back to play a second, third, fourth time, you joyously and eagerly pick up the hints in the story details and the dialogue, and like every time you're just kind of like learning something new. What a great game. Bye-bye.